हेलो स्टूडेंट्स टुडे विल डिस्कस अबाउट द क्वाड्रेंट्स ऑफ एब्डोमिनल वॉल नो वेन यू विल हैव द इंटीरियर एब्डोमिनल वॉल देर आर नाइन क्वाड्रेंट्स आर प्रेजेंट सो टुडे विल डिस्कस द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ दीज क्वाड्रेंट्स एंड हाउ टू डू द सरफेस मार्किंग ऑफ दीज क्वाड्रेंट्स इन योर एग्जाम्स सो वॉट इज द इंट्रोडक्शन सो द इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ द क्वाड्रेंट्स इज दैट द एंटीरियर एब्डोम वॉल इज डिवाइडेड इन टू द नाइन रीजन्स and these nine reasons are there for the purpose of mainly your clinical uses so what are the clinical uses of these nine reasons the first is sometimes you have to describe the site of the pain you have to specify the pain on the intraabdominal wall of your patient then sometimes you may have some abnormal swellings which are protruding through the anterior abdominal wall again you have to define that which part of the anterior abdominal wall is having the swelling so once you are writing the prescription the fellow doctor when see those prescription will come to know that where the patient is having the problem in this whole anterior abdominal wall then sometimes the surgeon puts the incision on anterior abdominal wall and there is specific for the specific organs according to the different quadrants of abdominal wall so my dear friends when you are reading the intraabdominal wall if you have this question what is the use of these quadrants why we are dividing the quadrants of intraabdominal wall you have to reply that for the site of the pain for the swelling of and for the incision of the different regions of anterior abdominal wall so these reasons are defined by the lines on the surface of anterior abdominal wall and there are two vertical lines and the two horizontal lines so when you will see the anterior view of your abdominal wall in this anterior abdominal wall which is actually starts that starts from your subcostal area so where is the subcostal area now these are the subcostal areas and this is your inguinal region so in between this whole area we will divide the anterior abdominal wall into the different quadrants so what are the vertical lines first we'll see so there are two vertical lines the vertical lines on first is each side of mid clavicular line so when you are having the two vertical line one is on the right side now this is your vert, uh, clavicle and this is almost the center point of the clavicle so when you will see the clavicle and if we'll have the center point of the clavicle and if i will go vertically downward from this point then it is known as mid clavicular line so we are drawing one line from the center of the clavicle and we are going vertically downwards so the vertical line on each side correspond to the mid clavicular line that means we are starting from the mid point of the clavicle and they are also termed as right and left vertical plane so sometimes you don't have the uh, this term mid clavicular but you have the option uh, name is your vertical plane so you have the right vertical plane you have the left vertical plane now these lines passes from the midpoint of the clavicle superiorly which we have just told, uh, discussed but when we will see the lower end of this mid clavicular line is very important so where is the lower end of the this line so if you will trace it downward you know that in the lower part here you are having the inguinal region now in this inguinal region you are having the inguinal ligament so when you are tracing this line downward it will touch this inguinal region at one point now what is that point actually so that point is known as mid inguinal point what is that mid inguinal point so this vertical line starts from mid clavicular point to mid inguinal point now this mid inguinal point is very important to understand you have to keep in mind that there are two separate points one is known as mid point of inguinal ligament another which we are reading is mid inguinal point so what is mid inguinal point now when you will see the mid inguinal point it is a mid point or it is a midway between the asis and the pubic symphysis now see the point is mid inguinal point that means it is a mid point of the whole inguinal region 
Now you know that the inguinal ligament attached from ASIS to pubic tubercle, but the inguinal region is from ASIS to pubic symphysis. So you have to understand that when you are talking about the mid inguinal point, this is your joint. Now this joint is between the two pubic bone and this is your anterior superior iliac spine. So this is your anterior superior iliac spine. So when you will see the distance between these two points, now this distance is the distance of inguinal region. And I am talking about the midpoint of this region, which is known as mid inguinal point. Suppose you are having the question on midpoint of inguinal ligament, then you have to approach the pubic tubercle. So on this side, we've removed the skin and you can see that this is the medial attachment of inguinal ligament on the pubic tubercle. So this is your ASIS and here you are having the pubic tubercle. So this distance from ASIS to the pubic tubercle is not equal to the distance from ASIS to pubic symphysis. That means the midpoint of inguinal ligament is different and mid inguinal point is different. So when you are tracing the vertical planes, they are crossing this here, clear? So you have to keep this thing in mind that mid inguinal point is a midway of ASIS and pubic symphysis, not pubic tubercle. Now the mid inguinal point marks the position where deep to the inguinal ligament, you are having the external iliac artery and you know that external iliac artery enters into the thigh as femoral artery. So this is the very commonly asked question in your exam where you are going to palpate the femoral artery. So when you are palpating the femoral artery, you have to first identify the midpoint of this inguinal region of the patient and then you have to just keep your finger below this mid inguinal point. So if you'll go just one centimeter below this mid inguinal point, you are able to feel the pulsations of femoral artery. Now in this image, you can appreciate that here you can see this is your ASIS and this is your pubic symphysis. So the midway of this area is your mid inguinal point and just below that if I will palpate the artery in this region, you are able to feel the pulsation of femoral artery. So this is the one question for your exam. So when you are talking about the anterior abdominal wall quadrants, we are using the two vertical lines and these lines are passing from the mid clavicular point above to the mid inguinal point below. Now, what about the horizontal planes? Now, there are two horizontal planes, one is upper and one is lower. Now, upper horizontal plane is known as transpyloric plane. Now, dear students, you have to understand that here is a word is known as Edison. Now, Edison is the word of a scientist, name of a scientist. So this is the whole name is Edi the Edison's transpyloric plane or transpyloric plane of Edison's. Or sometimes you have Edison's plane only. The second plane is the transtubercular plane. So on this anterior abdominal wall, if you will see these plane, you have to first understand that the lowermost is the sacrum. Now where is the sacrum? Now this is the sacrum. Now above the sacrum, you are having the lumbar vertebra. So this is the fifth, fourth, third, second and first. Now when you will have the transpyloric plane, the transpyloric plane is going to pass from your L1 vertebra but upper border or lower border. So mostly you will have the transpyloric plane is passing from the lower border of your L1 vertebra. So you will have the transpyloric plane here. So we'll see the detail of the transpyloric plane that what are the different uses of this plane. So the transpyloric plane of Edison is a horizontal plane. So the first thing is the horizontal. That means it is placed horizontally and it divides the body into the upper and lower half. It is almost the midway between the jugular notch of the sternum and the top of the pubic symphysis. Now where is the jugular notch? Now this is the jugular notch. So this is the jugular notch of the patient 
and this is your pubic symphysis. So this is the superior surface of pubic symphysis. Now almost the midway of this distance is having the transpyloric plane. Now it is approximately midway between the xiphoid process and umbilicus. So what is the second thing to uh, draw this in the exam? That rather than taking the distance from the jugular notch to the pubic symphysis, you can take the distance from the ziphy sternum which is here and the center point of the umbilicus. So you can take the center point of this distance or you can take the center of this distance. Clear? So ultimately what you are going to find that you are having the transpyloric plane is here. So this transpyloric plane is a midway between the jugular notch and pubic symphysis or I can say the midway of ziphy sternum and umbilicus. Now it lies at the level of the L1 vertebra but where lower border. So this is the very commonly asked question in your exam that what is the vertebral level of transpyloric plane or the transpyloric plane passes through which vertebrae? Answer is lower water of L1. It lies roughly a hand breadth below the ziphy sternum that will come in a midway between the umbilicus and ziphoid process. The transpyloric plane cross the pylorus of the isthmus. That's why you are having the word transpyloric plane. So if you will have the transpyloric plane, you will realize that you are having the stomach and stomach is having a part is known as pylorus. So pylorus is the lowermost end of the stomach and this pylorus is present at the level of L1 which crosses the pyloric part and that's why the word comes pyloric plane. Now anteriorly, it is passes through the tip of 9th costal cartilage. Posteriorly, we have seen that it is passing through the lower border of L1, but it is a horizontal plane. So anteriorly, when you will approach, you will realize that it is passing from the tip of 9th costal cartilage. Now, the important thing which you have to understand is that anteriorly, it is passing through the tip of 9th costal cartilage and vertically, if you will draw the right vertical plane, you will realize that they both are crossing each other at this point and this point is the point where you are having the maximum tenderness in case of the patient of cholecystitis that means the inflammation of gallbladder. So my dear students this is the important thing to understand that transpyloric plane on the right side and left side both side it is cutting the tip of 9th costal cartilage but on the right side you will find that it is the point where you are having the intersection of the transpyloric plane and the right vertical plane and this point is the point of maximum tenderness in case of cholecystitis or you can say we will elicit the Murphy's sign here. Now there are many organs present along the transpyloric plane. So this is a separate question that what is the importance of transpyloric plane. So these are the long list of the organs which come across the transpyloric plane. So the first is the pylorus of the stomach. That's why the pylorus of the stomach is present on the transpyloric. So the word is pylorus. Second, you know that pylorus continue as a first part of the duodenum. So but obviously the beginning of the duodenum. Third is the neck of the pancreas. Now when you see the neck of the pancreas, you will realize that the pancreas is a axis which is going towards the spleen towards the left side. So pancreas is not placed horizontally. The pancreas is having an oblique axis and the axis is going towards the left side. You have the spleen here. So in this diagram, you know that the pancreas occupy the concavity of your duodenum. So if you draw the pancreas, this pancreas is having the uncinate process and this is going something like this. Clear? So this is the neck of the pancreas and this neck portion is also lies in front of your L1 vertebrae. If you will count the vertebrae here, this is your L5, this is 4, this is 3 and you will have the 2 somewhere and you have the L1. So this L1, L2 vertebral level, you will have the neck of pancreas, you will have the pylorus of the stomach, you have the beginning of the duodenum. So this transpyloric plane 
is important because we are not having only the pylorus, you are having the beginning of duodenum, neck of the pancreas, but the very important part is hilum of kidney. Now, this is something is very important. Now, suppose in exam you have the surface markings of the kidney. Now, dear student, you have to understand that you know kidneys are attached on the posterior abdomen wall. So, where you have to draw? Some students draw kidneys very low in the anterior uh, on the abdomen, in the abdomen, but it is not like that. So, you should have the idea that you have to first find out the transpyloric plane. And transpyloric plane is crossing the hilum of the kidney. Now, there are two kidneys, right and left. And you know that above the right kidney, you have the liver. So, because of that, the right kidney is little bit lower and the left kidney is little bit higher. So, when you will draw the transpyloric plane, it is not passing at the similar level of both the kidney. Why? Because the right kidney is little bit lower because of the liver. So, that we will see in the coming slide that how to do the surface marking of the liver in refer reference of transpyloric plane. Then, you have the cornus medullaris. Now, what is cornus medullaris? It is the lower end of the spinal cord. So, when you will trace the transpyloric plane posteriorly, I told you that it is passing through the lower border of L1. And the lower border of L1 is the site where the spinal cord ends and its lower end is known as cornus medullaris. So, this is again very important question for your exam. The next is the fundus of the gallbladder, which I already told you that when you will go on the right side, you are having the intersection of the right vertical and the transpyloric plane, which is the site of the maximum tenderness. Then you are having the origin of superior mesenteric artery from the abdominal aorta, which is again at the level of L1 and L1 is for transpyloric plane. Now, my dear students, now this is what actually I am talking about. Now here in this image, you can see that this is your gallbladder. Now this is your fundus of the gallbladder which is actually presents on the tip of ninth costal cartilage. So, where is the costal cartilage is? Now, if you draw the, this is your ninth rib and if you draw the complete costal cartilage, you will find that this is the tip of ninth costal cartilage. And if you draw the vertical plane, this vertical plane is crossing almost on the tip of ninth costal cartilage, which is your point of gallbladder. Now, this is what you can see the pancreas. Now, the pancreas is not placed horizontally. It is having an oblique axis and its axis is going towards the left side. So, it is going towards the left side where you will have the spleen. Now, this is the portion of the neck of your pancreas. And this is actually the level of transpyloric plane which is passing through the gallbladder on the right side. And this transpyloric plane is passing from the lower border of L1. So, this vertebrae is L1 vertebrae. So, you will find that this neck of the pancreas lies in front of the junction of L1, L2. Now, this is your kidneys. Now, here first you have to identify the where is the lumbar vertebrae. So, this is your L5, this is 4, 3, 2 and 1. And we are saying that our plane is passing from the lower border of L1. So, this is the lower border of L1 where you are having the plane. Now, here what you are able to understand. Now, this is what you have to realize that this is the hilum of your right kidney and this is the hilum of your left kidney. So, when you are doing the surface marking, you have to keep in mind that almost the kidneys are having the intersection with the hilum. And the right kidney is lower down. Why it is lower down? Because you are having the liver, which is a very big organ. And this liver is pushing the right kidney downwards. So, apart from that, you have this concept that when I am drawing the kidney, I will not draw the kidney here. I cannot draw the kidney here. I have to first keep this thing in mind that for drawing the kidney, I have to find out the level of transpyloric plane. So, if I am going from anterior side, I can count the ribs and on the tip of ninth costal cartilage, I can assume the transpyloric plane. But if I am coming from the posterior side, I can count the spine from the lower part or from upper part to identify the L1. Clear? Now, 
In this video, you can see the conus medullaris. Now, these are the your green color five lumbar vertebra. Now, I am saying that at the lower border of this L1, at this level, if I will remove this, you will find the conus medullaris, which has to be cone-like lower end of the spinal cord. And this has to be seen if I remove this green color area, that is L1. So see here that in this part, we have removed this vertebrae. Now, as soon as you will remove the vertebrae, here you will find that now this tapering end is seen and this tapering end of the spinal cord is known as conus medullaris. So this is, is the importance of the lower border of L1 plane or it is transpyloric plane. So suppose this is our anterior abdominal wall and I have to draw the transpyloric plane. So what I can do is that I just go through this suprasternal notch and this is your pubic symphysis and I will take the midway and this midway has to pass from the tip of ninth costal cartilage. So this is the transpyloric plane. Clear? Now, sometimes some clinicians not use the transpyloric plane. They use a new word, new plane is subcostal plane. Now, this subcostal plane is a little lower level than your transpyloric plane. And the subcostal plane is a transverse plane which passes through the 10th costal margin or L3 vertebrae. So, in this diagram, you can see that if I am taking the transpyloric plane, then it is passing through the lower border of L1. So, this is the transpyloric plane. But if I am taking the lower plane, that is your subcostal plane, then it is passing through the L3. Clear? Then you have the next second horizontal plane is transtubercular plane. Now, what is the meaning of tubercle? Now, here you are using the word tubercle. Now, this tubercle is actually the tubercle of your iliac crest of hip bone. Now, when you will see the iliac crest of the hip bone on outer border, 5 centimeter behind the ASIS, you are having this tubercle. So, you can see this tubercle. Now, this is your ASIS. Now, from the ASIS, if you will go posteriorly, you are having this tubercle. In the same way, we will find the tubercle on the outer side of this side. So, if you join both the tubercle, you are having a plane is known as transtubercular plane. And transtubercular plane crosses the L5, that is upper border. We have seen the transpyloric plane, which crosses the L1 lower border. Here it is L5 upper border. Clear? Now, so once you are having these two horizontal, two vertical line, now this is what you can see there are nine quadrant appears. So we'll make first the right vertical. These are the two vertical lines. Then we are using the transpyloric plane rather than the subcostal plane. So if you are using the transpyloric plane, so this is the transpyloric plane and this is your transtubercular plane. So in this way, there are nine quadrants. This is the first right three quadrants left three quadrants and three midline quadrants. Now the right and left quadrants are having similar name. This is right hypochondrium. This is left hypochondrium. Then this is your right and left lumbar fossa and right and left iliac fossa. Now in the midline from above downward, you are having epigastric region, umbilical region and hypogastric region. Clear? So these are the two hypochondrium, lumbar and iliac fossa. In the midline, you have the epigastrium, umbilical and hypogastrium. So these are the names which are written here. Now this is what the actually exam you have. Now you have the dummy where you have the anterior dome wall and you have to mark your planes. So what you have to do is you have to first mark the two vertical plane, this is the right vertical plane, which is passing from the mid clavicular line to the mid inguinal point. This is the left vertical plane, which is again passing from the left mid clavicular point to the left mid inguinal point. 
then i have to draw the two horizontal plane the horizontal plane is first passing from the tip of ninth costal cartilage or hand width below the is uh, your zygoid process which has to be here and one is the trans tubercular plane clear now these are the quadrant so this is the first second third fourth fifth sixth seven eight and nine so these are the nine quadrants of anterior abdominal wall now this is what question you have sometimes that which are the organs related to different quadrants you have now having the nine quadrants so you will realize that there are different organs in the right and left side the liver is coming in the right hypochondrium spleen is coming in the left hypochondrium you are having the right kidney in the right lumbar region you are having the left kidney in the left lumbar region so you are having such questions that which are the organs in different quadrants so the for example you are having the question that name the organs which are present in the right hypochondrium so in the right hypochondrium you are having the liver and gall bladder but if i am talking about the left side hypochondrium then the answer will change on the left side you are having the stomach you are having the spleen which is more commonly asked question and the left flexor of the colon now if you will talk about the epigastric region or this is also known as the region between the two costal margin or in the subcostal angle so in this subcostal angle you are having the stomach duodenum and pancreas now what are the difference between the organs of right and left lumbar region on the right side you are having right kidney and but obviously the right adrenal gland the right ureter and ascending colon on the left side you are having the descending colon you have the left kidney and the left ureter now what are the organs present in the umbilical region so in umbilical region you are having the midline and paramedian structure what is the midline structure is abdominal aorta you are having the inferior vena cava and the mostly you will have the coils of intestine which are mainly present all around the umbilicus then you have the right and left iliac fossa now the right iliac fossa is more frequently asked question that what are the structures present in the right iliac fossa suppose in your university exam you are having the right hip bone in your hand you know the iliac fossa is present now the question is that name the organs which are related with this part of the bone that means you are having this question the right iliac fossa so what are the two organs you have cecum and appendix in the same way if you are having the left hip bone in your hand and the question asked is that name the organ which are related to the iliac fossa of this bone answer is sigmoid colon now what is the structure lies in the hypogastrium so hypogastrium means the area which is below the umbilicus so in this midline area below the umbilicus you are having the urinary bladder some coils of intestine which are protruding downward and the uterus but uterus is not the abdominal organ uterus is a pelvic organ the uterus once it will enlarge you can feel the uterus in the infraumbilical region so this is the important thing that it is it has to be the enlarged uterus now there is a one more important question related to the iliac fossa the iliac fossa is related with the renal transplant the kidney transplant is heterotopic now what is the meaning of this heterotopically transplanted kidney that means we are not transplanting the kidney at its normal position in a normal human being the kidneys are placed on the posterior abdominal wall in lumbar region so if you are removing the kidney here and you are implanting a new kidney at the same place then it is homo but we are not using the same place we are using a different place that's why we are using word hetero so the kidneys are always have heterotropic uh, topical transplantation that means we are not using the normal placement of the kidneys which are lumbar fossa where we are using we are placing the kidney in the iliac fossa so the kidneys are placed heterotopically in the extra peritoneal spaces in iliac fossa so this is the main question of your exam the another important thing is that why we are placing the kidney in the iliac fossa not in the same area the only answer is that we have to save the graft 
that means the donor kidney so you want to avoid the failure of donor kidney for that you have to restart the functioning of that transplant kidney because once the donor kidney has been taken out from the donor it has to implant in the recipient as early as possible so to avoid that time lapse you need the superficial vessels which are big big in enough and you can do the anastomosis of renal artery and renal vein very fast so for that we have the common iliac vein and the common iliac arteries which are very easily approachable in the iliac fossa so the only purpose to do the heterotopic transplantation is that to achieve the optimal function of the kidney and it is done by the two things one is to prevent the delay graft functioning that means we have to achieve the very fast functioning of the kid donor kidney otherwise it is going to fail and second thing is avoid the technical complications resulting in the loss of kidney transplant so my dear students this is very commonly asked question in exam why the kidney is transplant in the iliac fossa and your answer has to be for the fast functioning of donor kidney which is done by the approaching of these great vessels that is the common iliac vein and the artery in the iliac fossa now the anastomosis of the renal artery and the veins are performed end to side if you are doing the anastomosis then it is end to end here we are doing end to side so in this diagram you can see that this is your vein which are anastomosis on the side of this uh, iliac vein and this is the arteries and the veins so you will realize that there is a vertical artery and the renal artery is coming on the side so it is a end to side anastomosis now there is one more question that if you will have a child in the child where you will do the transplant answer is that in the child we are using the aorta and we are using the inferior vena cava for the anastomosis we are not using the iliac veins in the child so this is something is important which may be asked in your exam that what are the importance of iliac fossa or what are the organs are present in iliac fossa so this is what you may have sometimes that kidneys are present in iliac fossa which are transplanted kidneys and why they are present in iliac fossa not in lumbar region the only purpose is to avoid the failure of donor kidney so now at the end of this class you are able to understand how to divide the nine abdominal regions what are the clinical importance of the nine regions what are the lines which are responsible to form these nine regions so this is all for today's class thank you